What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist, revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. Welcome back to our listener. According to the voices in my head, my name is Tom Semioli. My co-host is David C. Gross. David, please afford greetings and salutations to our audience member. Oh, Karen. Oh, Karen. Karen. Oh, Karen. Oh, Karen. Oh, Karen. Oh, Karen. How are you tonight? How are you tonight? How are you tonight? <laughs> Karens, the Karens of the world. Tonight, David, we're going back in time when a new telecommunications medium known as television was capturing the attention of the American masses, yourself included. Indeed. Our guest tonight is author John Burlingame. We are here to discuss his new book, Dreamsville, Henry Mancini, Peanut Gun, and Music for TV Noir which is available now on Bear Manor Media. Now, Peter Gunn, David, as you remember, was an American private eye television series, which ran from 1958 to 1960. It was a landmark series created specifically for television by director, producer, screenwriter, Blake Edwards, who I think made a few decent movies. Yes, he did. And as a matter of fact, not only that, but when we were talking with John, went deep into Blake Edwards' career, and there was a wonderful radio show that he did years Years before Peter Gunn called Richard Diamond Private Eye with Dick Powell as Richard Diamond. Originally, it was called The Singing Detective because if any of you go back far enough to the Busby Berkeley movies and the Hollywood Gold Digger movies, Dick Powell was what they called an ingenue. He was a young singer, always doing the romantic parts. I'm young and healthy and you've got charms. It really is in not have you in my arms. And then all of a sudden he did, uh, I guess it was Farewell, My Lovely. If I hadn't been in my office that night when my brain cells playing hide and seek with those dizzy flashes down the street, I'd have never got messed up with a stolen jade necklace. I've never hired a detective before. And he recreated himself as a uh, crime detective. Fascinating uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, of course, Peter Gunn is iconic not only for its story context, but for its legendary Peter Gunn theme, composed by the great Henry Mancini. Countless rock jazz musicians have interpreted this song from Dwayne Eddy to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. We'll have to play that in our playlist. It's a motif that everyone knows. David, we both play it on the E strings of our respective basses, a part of the American lexicon of music. You are correct, sir. Yeah. Now, John is a fascinating guy. He is a TV scholar. He's written many books on its history and its effects on just about every facet of American life in the latter half of the 20th century. I highly recommend you read John, and we definitely will have him back on the show to discuss his other books. Big Bad John. Big John. Now, what role TV is going to play in the 21st century, given the dominance of digital technology and artificial intelligence? And of course, David, this book really resonated with you because you recalled seeing the show in its initial run. Old man, look at my life. I'm a lot like you were. But not only that show, another show that he articulates is Mr. Lucky with uh, John Vivian and Ross Martin. And once again, Henry Mancini does this major hit with a theme song of a TV thing. And Echo about TV in the late 50s, particularly the, the crime noir, this was an amazing time for jazz. And you could almost see from reading the book how when the Beatles hit, all of these guys got scared, angry, and a confrontational. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Because one day they would do theme for Peter Gunn. The next day they do Mr. Lucky. A few weeks later, it would be lineup. This show, that show, movies, etc. But then when the Beatles hit, everything changed. You didn't need all these quote unquote jazz musicians because all you needed was bass drums and a couple of guitars, maybe a keyboard. 
Yeah. So you could almost understand where they were coming from because of all the work they had. Yes, exactly. And you know what's cool? This book really comes to life, not only in the pages, but on YouTube now. We can watch all the Peter Gunn episodes. They're available along with the amazing archival footage of Henry Mancini, right? Which was a huge presence when I was a kid. And uh, the various actors in the series. So that's one of the fun aspects of this book is that we can watch all of that. It's been restored beautifully on YouTube. So you will definitely want to check out what John John is writing about. And again, a very charming guest. We definitely want to have John back on the show. But David and John, we have to do the plugs, David. This is your favorite part of the show. I understand that. Before we do our plugs, yes. or, or actually have our plugs put in. We need hair uh, plugs at this one point. One of the things that I found really fascinating about the book were the musicians involved. Mm. One of them was a guy named Johnny Williams. Here's Johnny! <laughs> And Johnny Williams played piano. But when Johnny became John, he became John Williams, one of the top soundtrack people on the planet to this day. And Tom, can you rattle off a couple of John Williams' great soundtracks? I cannot, David, but I'm sure you can. Yeah, well, Star Wars just happened to be one of them, so... Oh, ain't too shabby. And <laughs> one of those minor hits. Yeah. yeah. So now that we've been unplugged why don't you plug us in let's plug you the audience may be listening to david and myself every monday night on cygnus internet radio let me spell that for you c-y-g-n-u-s you cue that up on the internet browser of your choice www.cygnusradio.com you karen could be listening to us on our notes from an artist podcast streaming right now david as we speak on apple and I wherever put my pants back on put your <laughs> put your trousers on mate lost the button on your trousers again on apple and where the hell ever podcasts are potted spotify buzz where the hell ever are podcasts potted tom they're everywhere david they're everywhere they're, they're, they're infectious check out our youtube page see what we look like oddly enough uh, david we uh, named that youtube page notes from an artist and you can enjoy behind the scenes clips you can enjoy in front of the scenes clips all sorts of clips it's a clippage fest if you will and any clips up in that and if you really lead a vacant boring life why not log on to www.notesfromanartist.com where you can see touched up pictures of david and myself to keep up with whatever we're doing at any given moment uh wives not included and david at the end of this show after our conversation with mr burlingame we will have a playlist we certainly will okay so let's bring john in and then we'll talk playlist welcome to the show john burlingame what happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers bassist educator author david c gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. And there he is. <laughs> This works, John. Well, does it work? How do I sound? You sound great. Welcome to the 21st century, us old guys on Zoom. And the actual words are coming out simultaneously, so that's Hello. a really good thing. You know? My name is... <laughs> Hi, David. Hi, Tom. How you doing, John? There. I can't thank you enough for having me on. Oh, man. Why? I guess you haven't seen our show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. It's a podcast. You can't watch it. Although we do put some, when we have glamorous rock stars on, we, we uh, release the videos. But uh, Oh, so, yes. so our, I, didn't, I, didn't have, was I didn't have to dress up today. Though. You didn't have to be right. You didn't have to put anything on, actually. No, no. <laughs> actually, um, neither Tom and I are wearing pants. Stop. Damn. Will you stop, Dave? I'm afraid, Dave. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yes. That's the I was afraid of, someone would say that. Yes, that's uh, we're very unwoke here. But anyway, Dave, let us introduce John Burlingame to our audience member. He is an award-winning author. He's a journalist. He's a lecturer. He's an educator. He is a podcast host, David. To use the words of Dr. Irwin Corey, John Burlingame is a foremost authority on the subject of music for films and television. David, you've read John in numerous publications, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Premiere, among others, and several of the top daily newspapers 
newspapers and their corresponding websites because we don't have newspapers anymore. John has written several books, including New Music for Prime Time, The History of American Television Theme. That, that's fascinating. Uh, the Music of James Bond, we're all big fans. And Sound and Vision, 60 Years of Motion Picture Soundtrack. But David, we are here to talk about his new book, Dreamsville. Oh, Tom, he makes a great sauce. Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John's new book, which we have to help him sell now, David. Dreamsville, Henry Mancini, Peter Gunn, and the Music for TV Noir, available now on Bear Manor Media. Before we get to that, John, let's talk about your podcast, Disney Presents for Scores, where you do interviews with film and TV composers. I enjoy that. I listened to a few of your interviews with John Williams, Rob Marshall, Alan Menken, and it's fascinating behind the scenes anecdotes that you don't have to be a film buff to enjoy and learn from. Well, thanks for listening. I really appreciate those words. It was great fun until Disney canceled it right after the John Williams episode, which, by the way, got a Webby nomination. And of course, then Disney decided they didn't want to spend any more money. So that was a, that was out the window. So now I'm doing podcasts for Dolby, the Dolby Foundation, which is just as much fun, but it's more about contemporary movies, big things that are coming out now. But okay. I did love doing the Disney podcast for, I don't know, three or four years. I must tell you that it's very hard to now call him John Williams after reading this book. <laughs> That's right. We should talk yes, about that. Is. He oh, well, I've got a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. Tom does too. Talking podcasts, because, you know, all of us are, were born before the podcast era. <laughs> Obviously, it's certainly born of radio, but in radio, you constantly have to chase advertising dollars. But in the podcast world, you can really stretch out artistically and academically, which is what I enjoyed. I mean, imagine a podcast with Blake Edwards and Henry Mancini. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, boy. Uh, I do have some, I have both guys on tape, which would be mm. fun. We probably should have talked about that before we started this. <laughs> we could have had sound bites from Blake and Henry. Talking about Dreamsville now, take us back to the early days of television. Gor Vidal, who we all know, famously commented that television is referred to as a medium because it's uh, neither rare nor well done. In the days of when Peter Gunn is out, 1959, 1960, this is a new medium. This is an unknown platform. What were some of the challenges that early television had to face? Well, particularly on the music side, I suppose it's really no different today than it was then. People don't want to spend money hiring composers and musicians. You, you always have to twist everybody's arm. And so in those early days of TV in the 1950s, there was actually surprisingly little music written specifically for television shows. The producers of I Love Lucy and Dragnet were kind of the exceptions to the rule. Both of those people wanted fresh music every week on their shows. So they spent the extra money to hire bands in Hollywood to be part of that whole process. But the Musicians Union, the American Federation of Musicians, was run by some fairly backward thinking people at the time who just were somehow opposed to kind of money that they that was going to be spent on on musicians. So actually few shows had fresh scores. That's one of the things that made Peter Gunn special when it went on the air in 1958 was Blake Edwards, who wrote and created Peter Gunn, understood the value of not just a fresh music every week, but a certain kind of music that was not just going to propel the action, but was listenable, melodic, cool jazz, West Coast style jazz, which was very much of the moment. And the result was, you know, as I talk about in the book, not just a successful television show with a fresh original score, but something that sold hundreds of thousands of record albums as well. I find most amazing is that here I am, I'm close to your age, and I can hum and sing both the Peter Gunn theme and the Mr. Lucky theme because it was so embedded for me at five or six years old back then. It was great stuff. But one of the things, though, that I think most people today do not realize that TV really started in 48, albeit there was remnants of, of the beginnings of TV that go back, I think, to the 30s even. That's right. But when 48 came around, it was, well, you had stations you'd never even heard, Dumont Network and stuff like that. But really, Tom and I talk about this all the time, how the actors were actually really actors. Not only were they actors, but they were musicians. They did numerous things. You know, you talk about Herschel Bernardi back in vaudeville. Well, Jesus, you had to do a ton of stuff back then. Right. They were uh, they were born of the theater, which is a totally different aesthetic. It's like David and I are musicians and uh, you're a fan of 60s music. What made that era so innovative and groundbreaking? Because the artists that came along in the 60s, whether it was the Beatles or the Stones, whoever, 
They didn't grow up listening to rock and roll. They listen to classical music. They listen to jazz. They listen to folk. And the same thing why I'm so fascinated with this era of actors, because they came from the theater. It's a totally different way of working. The, the, the facial expressions, the vocal. You would never have a, a TV character like a Larry Storch or a Corporal Aegon or somebody, the Skipper and Gilligan, the theatric. You would never have that now because that's what they did in theater. You had to emote and gesticulate. You had to overcompensate because you had to play to the back row. What both of you guys are touching on is really important to me, especially because I grew up in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. And so we all remember how great TV was. You know, there's all this talk about how we're in a new golden age of television and, and, and all that sort of stuff with the multiple streaming options and all that sort of thing. But I have to say, TV in the 50s and the 60s was really great. For the reasons you guys point out, many of the people, not only in front of the camera, but especially behind the camera, mm -hmm. came from the theater. And when you look at people like the writers, particularly Rod Serling, Reginald Rose, Gore Vidal, J.P. Miller, all of these great, great writers largely came from a, the discipline of the theater. So the scripts were really good and the acting was really good. I mean, you look, look at Patty those... Chayefsky. Oh, exactly. And that, he's yeah. the one he's first on the list or should be. And so these guys were great. And the kind of TV that they they wrote. Now, Blake Edwards didn't come to the theater. He came from radio. And we have a lot to talk about Blake Edwards and radio. <laughs> and but, but I want to hold this because I want to go through season one into season two before before I, I, I talk about that. But the, the thing I think that's most important about TV being black and white is that a lot of the B-movie and film noir directors and cinematographers knew what a shadow was. Yeah. And those shadows are in early Rod Serling, uh, Twilight Zone, uh, obviously Peter Gunn, Mr. Lucky. That is something that never happened again. And the other thing, I think the most important thing, which is something that baffles Tom and me now, these writers actually read books. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? We read your book cover to cover. We did. Every, we like to read. We, yeah, every author we we interview, we read the books. Yeah, uh, but you, you talk about black and white. One of the things now, right, that was the medium. So that was one of the challenges, I guess. This inspired me to watch Peter Gunn well, episodes on YouTube. And then I remember my parents had the records. I was like, oh, this is my parents' record collection. My goodness, Henry Mancini. And even the people who are extras are so charismatic. You had the bespoke wardrobes and things. Talk about now, obviously we look at black and white as a limitation, but apparently it wasn't. What about the actual sound of a television? I mean, the Henry Mancini's music sounded good coming out of a little tinny speaker. Hey, I'm glad you mentioned that. One of the innovations of Peter Gunn came from Henry, not just in terms of what he was writing, but how they were recording it. He tells the story or told the story that when they went to record the pilot, they did the usual thing of hanging one mic over the band. And Henry said, let's not do that. Let's mic individual musicians, and then we'll mix it together later. You would never have been able to hear those bass flutes had Henry not specifically mic'd those guys carefully and closely. It was a revelation in a sense, because everything was being done on the cheap and quickly and people just didn't give the time and attention to proper recording techniques the way Henry Mancini wanted to do it. And the other a great advantage here uh, that we haven't spoken about is the fact that Peter Gunn was an independent production, was not a product of one of the specific major studios, Paramount, Universal, one of those. Blake owned the show. Blake Edwards owned the show. And we con called all the shots. So when Henry said, yeah, I want to do it this way, Blake said, you, un you know it, you know, it's, it's your field, go right ahead. And so the sound of Peter Gunn the, and the way we hear those instruments in those scores is really special. And one more factor in, in what people didn't realize at the time was actually innovative television. Yeah, yeah, it's very much so. And you mentioned yeah, independent. Well, again, uh, David and I as musicians, our favorite record labels, Blue Note, Verve, uh, those guys over in uh, in Liverpool on on EMI Records, those were all independent record labels. Those were the those were the innovators. Yeah, that's right. But Henry also had the respect of his players. We learn here because he didn't write out their solos and he guided them on what register to play in. And when a family allows session player flexibility, 
This book, section by section, you got to read the ink, right, David? It's, just stick to the ink, which is not the norm. You get better performances from the band because they're more invested in the process. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and it's one of the things that makes me most excited mm-hmm. about not only writing about this, but just listening again and again. Henry Mancini, yes, he had come out of the big band era and he had he had played for the Tex Beneke band, which was the outgrowth of the old of the old Glenn Miller band. And so he had played piano. And and arranged quite a lot for those guys. Then spent six years at Universal learning the craft of film scoring, mostly doing B movies that are mostly forgot forgotten today. But he learned that craft well. So now he comes to television, and he and he does Peter Gunn, and the band that he handpicks are all old big band veterans, but able to handle certain kinds of things. Particularly, they're all readers; they can all read, um, and and they're quick. And quick studies and and all great soloists. So people like Ronnie Lang and Dick Nash and um, and Ted Nash uh, and Dick Feldman. Feldman on vibes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and um, Shelley Mann on drums. All these guys came from came from the big band era and were all really great at what they did. Hi there. Nice to be with you. Happy you could stick around. Like to introduce Legs Larry Smith drums. And Sam Spoon's Rhythm Pole. And Vern Dudley Bohey Noel Bass Guitar. And Neil Innes Piano. Come in Rodney Slater on the saxophone. With Roger Ruskin Spear on tenor sax. Hi Vivian Stanchel Trumpet. Big hello to Big John Wayne Xylophone. And Robert Morley Guitar. Billy Butlin, Spoons. And looking very relaxed, Adolf Hitler on Vibes. Nice. Princess Anne on Sousaphone. Introducing Liberace clarinet. With Garner Ted Armstrong on vocals. Lord Snooty and his pals tap dancing. In the groove with Harold Wilson, violin. And Franklin McCormack on harmonica. Over there, Eric Clapton, ukulele. Hi, Eric. On my left, Sir Kenneth Park, bass sax. Great honor, sir. And specially flown in for us, a Sessions Gorilla on Vox Humana. Nice to see Incredible Shrinking Man on Euphonium. Drop out with Peter Scott on Duck Call. Hearing from you later, Casanova on Horn. Yeah, digging General De Gaulle on Accordion. Really wild, General. Thank you, sir. Roy Rogers on Trigger. Tune in Wild Man of Borneo on Bongos. Count Basie Orchestra on Triangle. Thank you. Great to hear the Rawlinsons on trombone. Back from his recent operation, Dan Drop, hot. And representing the flower people, Quasimodo on bells. Wonderful to hear Brainiac on banjo. We welcome Baldunican as himself. Very appealing, Max Jaffa. Mmm, that's nice, Max. What a team, Zebra Kid and Horace Bachelor on percussion. And a great favorite and a wonderful performer, all of us here, J. Arthur Rank on Gong. David, you earlier mentioned the piano player, one Johnny T. Williams, who we today know as the composer of Star Wars and and Jaws. But in 1958, 
He was a session piano player in Hollywood, and he had yet to start his own composing career, although he very quickly would. Uh, but he did play all of the first and second seasons of Peter Gunn and all of Mr. Lucky in the 59s. Yeah, then Jimmy Rawls came in, who was That's no right. slouch either, really. Right, right. And you know, while we're talking Victor Feldman, Larry Bunker's no baby either. You know? That's right. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's, it's fine. But I want to just take us back a little bit to the, the writers again. Now, these writers had started on radio. And what is most compelling, we had Greg Bell on the show. Greg Bell does the classic r radio shows on Sirius XM. And I, about four years ago, discovered the channel while driving from, I, I live in Connecticut, into Manhattan. And I became a big fan and we had to have him on the show. What was different about radio that transferred to the first generation of TV was that you still could use your mind to help create the scene. And that was a real specialty. I mean, listen to the early Jack Webbs, the early Dragnets, the lineup, of course, Richard Diamond, The Whistler, all of these shows. There was no way to see what that was. It was, but think of how many of those TV, of those radio shows, a became TV shows and some that became movies. I mean, there was yeah. a suspense episode called The Hitchhiker. The Hiker, that was a major, Edmund uh, O'Brien was in that. And so while I'm going through the book, I'm seeing all these actors who I know. I know their voices. I don't know what they look like. Case in point, do you remember the Twilight Zone episode where the guy was from Venus and the bus crashed, and they all were stuck in a place overnight, and there were 13 people in there, but there were only 12 people on the bus. <laughs> and so this one guy comes back, and he's got a half a dozen arms, and the guy behind the counter poisons him because he was from Venus. Well, that's Barney Phillips. Barney Phillips is one of the big names of radio. It's amazing. <laughs> I went out on that bus. And you know something? That bridge wasn't safe. It collapsed. The state police car, the bus, everything. Kaplunk, right into the river. It was a terrible scene. No one got out. Except you. Except me. <laughs> lucky, I guess, huh? Very lucky. What? You're not even wet. Wet? What's wet? What do you mean, what's wet? You landed in the river, but your clothes are all dry. Illusion, that's all. Just an illusion. Like that jukebox playing in the corner. That's an illusion, too. Or uh, that telephone ringing. It's an illusion, just a parlor trick. What are you, some kind of magician? <laughs> Who, me? Oh, hardly. Now, uh, before you uh, faint dead away, I ought to explain that the name isn't really Ross. And uh, I wasn't really going to Boston. Now, I was sent as a kind of advance scout. You know these uh, cigarettes, do you call them? They taste wonderful. We haven't got a thing like this on Mars. That's incidentally where I come from. We're beginning to colonize. My friends will be arriving very shortly. I think they're going to like it here. It's a lovely area, so 
So remote, so pleasant, so off the beaten track. Just the perfect spot for a colony, don't you think, Mr. Haley? While we're uh, waiting, how about a little what you call music? I don't mind. I have to do a little waiting myself. You see, Mr. Ross, my name isn't Haley. And I do agree with you, this is an extraordinary place to colonize. We folks on Venus had the same idea. We got it several years ago. And I think I really ought to tell you now that your friends are not coming. They've been intercepted. Oh, a colony is coming. But it's from Venus. And if you're still alive, I think you'll see how we differ. And I agree with you about what they call music. Why don't you play some? <laughs> Incident on a small island, to be believed or disbelieved. However, if a sour-faced dandy named Ross, or a big good-natured counterman who handles a spatula as if he'd been born with one in his mouth, if either of these two entities walk onto your premises, you better hold their hands, all three of them, or check the color of their eyes, all three of them. The gentleman in question might try to pull you into the Twilight Zone. There was an awful lot. There was so much more. And the limitation, once again, Tom, the hmm. limitation made them be more creative. And it's worth mentioning, I think, that this is where, although Blake Edwards had film experience as well before he got to Peter Gunn, he really got his feet wet writing episodic radio. He created Richard Diamond for, for radio. And you right. mentioned the lineup. He wrote for the lineup. So there was a lot of radio writing in his background. And he, he was an endlessly creative guy who, of course, wanted to get into movies because it was a much bigger thing. And radio was frankly dying in the 1950s. So he was moving on to film and, and then in television. A lot of the writers... And the actors, as you point out, David, actually did come from radio. And these guys were cast in these television shows. They knew their craft. So it's the first season of Peter Gunn. We got to have a hit. We got to do everything. So pretty well, all the episodes were brand new. 80% of the episodes in season two were Richard Diamond episodes. <laughs> Did you know that? You might find some people who would take issue with that, but certainly a lot of the ideas may have felt as if they were secondhand. I happen to love all of those Peter Guns. I, I spent a lot of time watching all 114 episodes, as you can imagine, before writing this book. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I will tell you, Blake Edwards told me that when Dick Powell sold Richard Diamond to television, Blake wasn't involved. In fact, Dick was going to cut Blake out financially of the whole thing until Blake found out about it and then went to Powell and said, you have to pay me. I created this show. Blake had nothing to do with Richard Diamond, the TV show, except to collect money every time one, one aired. Right. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised if some of those plots were similar. Oh, they were similar. They were identical. They, they really, <laughs> really were. I know the Richard Diamond series um, backwards and forwards. Another interesting thing was Tony Barrett. Oh, yes. I had no idea he was a writer. More importantly, I had no idea his wife wrote with him. That's right, Steffi. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Tony, Tony Barrett had been an actor back in the late 40s and early 50s, and again, wrote a lot for radio. But his career was transitioning into writing and away from acting. And so he wound up writing or co-writing something like half of all of those Peter Guns in that 58 to 61 period. He was incredibly prolific. And he left all of his scripts at UCLA. So it was really great to go through them and to see and the notes that he would get from his wife, Steffi, which were in there. You might want to do this. You might want to fix that. You know, this looks great. Thanks, honey. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. In the um, interviews you include with Henry, it's just amazing. It For him, it was another day at the office coming in to compose and put the show together. I'm, I, he's very matter of fact. The music became popular because the TV show was so good. And he had that working musician ethic. You do the job and you don't dwell on it. I like that you use the Beatles illusion and you just get on with the next gig, whether it's a masterpiece or a commercial flop, that's out of your control. You just you get on with the work. And again, you you know, you read about the, all the great artists from Miles to Mingus to the Rolling Stones. You know what you're doing is innovative, but you can't predict how something will be received. And, um, you know, for example, we talk 
you make the Beatles illusion, George Martin feared that Sgt. Pepper would be a flop because it was too complicated for listeners. And the same with Blake Edwards. He didn't see what he was doing as groundbreaking because he was supposed to merge in the work that you can't put it into perspective. Yeah, I, I actually put that question to Blake and he said, mm. well, I don't know if it was groundbreaking. He was just trying to make money with a TV mm-hmm. show. But of course, he couldn't help but be somewhat groundbreaking because of and when he started this was his this was his imagination let's set it in a river within a riverfront saloon let's have a band let's have a singer who's also the privatized girlfriend and the character of mother who ran the saloon was was i just loved her particularly in the first season she was great she was cranky she was constantly bugged by pete you know and there and his and his lower class lower class clients showing up i just it, it's just all fresh and really fun to watch. One of the reasons I think I, I wanted to write the book was to make sure this wasn't forgotten. I teach part time down at the University of Southern California. And when I get to Henry Mancini, I always play an episode of Peter Gunn. And I say, now, how many of you have seen this before? Of course, none of these kids have. <laughs> how many of you have heard the theme? Well, most of them have heard the theme. One of those instances where the music written for television transcends the medium and takes its place in a sort of larger um, context mm. in the in zeitgeist, you know. Um, but I want people to know this is a this is a really good show. This is worth catching. Twenty five minutes of sheer entertainment. I might add, very adult for its time. Pete would come home at two o'clock in the morning and settle in with with Edie uh, at his apartment and. We grown-ups sort of know what's going to happen, and it was pretty sexy stuff. And I'm actually kind of surprised they got away with it. It was sexy in a tasteful way. We don't, we don't, nobody's tearing their clothes off here, but the kisses are very sensual. There was an episode where that actually happened. <laughs> Sherry Jackson. Oh, well, that's in the movie. That's in the 67 movie, which we should talk about. Uh, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll, get yeah, there. well, you talk about adult, you know, David and I, we're huge fans of Dick Cavett. And that's what we try to model our show off of because we grew up and David, you actually saw the Dick Cavett show. Matter of fact, we wouldn't know David and I were driving up to Martha's Vineyard. We were binging on Dick Cavett uh, talking, you know, the audio books. And it prompted me because I was a, a little before my time was the uh, Jack Parr show. And you watch Jonathan Winters do his little improv and, you know, he's a gay baseball player. Now, I mean, my goodness, you couldn't get away with that. Or he's, what was it, the gay Captain Ahab chasing the <laughs> whale. And, and it's great stuff. And it's adult, it's grown up humor. This show, what was it on at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night? Peter Gunn started at nine o'clock on NBC and uh, on Monday nights, and but then did go to 1030. Right. Well, Jack Parr was on what, 10, 11 o'clock at night, I think at the time. Well, kids were supposed yeah. to be in bed at the time. You know, there was a time when they were grown ups and they were kids and you put the kids to bed and you told, you know, that they weren't allowed to watch this. This was for grown ups. And well, like another that. thing with Jack yeah. Parr, the re- everyone says it's Ed Sullivan. But no, the Beatles were on Jack Parr the previous right. summer, winter, sometime in November. But I appreciated that. And as a young person growing up in the 60s watching television, it was kind of cool to be allowed to watch the grown ups program. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, sure. And that's what you aspired to as a little kid. Wow, when I'm a grown-up, I can do this stuff. And it was definitely a, diff- a line between being a grown-up and a, and a kid. You know, it, was, it wasn't a show that pe- that families were supposed to sit around and watch, like the Ed Sullivan show with Telbo Gigio. And- Eddie, give me, give me good night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Eddie. You know, Jackie Mace showing us how the bear ate his camera. Or whatever. You've been so great, I have a bonus for you. <laughs> I'd like to show you some slides of my recent vacation. And slides are always a lot of fun. If you'll just look up here. In this first slide, I'm getting my car ready for the trip. And that's my car there, a little blue job, 49 Nash Rambler. And that's me inside, changing the sheets. It's a great little car. I just made the final payment about a week ago. It doesn't run anymore, but I sleep in it. This is the first day of my trip, entering the Holland Tunnel. This is the second day of my trip, coming out of the Holland Tunnel. (laughs) Here I am at the toll booth, tossing some money into the basket. Here I am under my car, looking for the money. (laughs) This was a few days later on the highway, I'm picking up a hitchhiker. There's a hitchhiker holding me up. There I am, hitchhiking. (laughs) 
there's a hitchhiker again, picking me up my own car. <laughs> Luckily, she didn't recognize me. <laughs> there's a little roadside restaurant. I stopped and had a bit of lunch. The food was terrible. I never complained, but cream cheese isn't supposed to make noise. <laughs> it's a horrible place. I ordered cherry herring, and they brought me a dish of herrings with cherries all over it. <laughs> it's hard to drink. The bowls got stuck in my throat. How'd that one get in there? <laughs> Here are the Wombapi Indians praying for rain. Here they are in a flood. They overprayed. Now we shoot all the way down to the Everglades in Florida. If you ever visit the Everglades, one thing you must have is a guide because it's very dangerous country. So I went to a place called Get a Guide Agency. There's a man behind a desk with a big cigar in his mouth. He says, come in, boy, what can I do for you? I said, is this Get a Guide Agency? He said, that's right, this is Get a Guide. Can I get your guides? I said, I'd like to get a guide. <laughs> Have you got a guide I can get? <laughs> he said, we got all kind of guides. What kind of guide would you like to get? I said, I'd like to get a guide who'll guide me. <laughs> he said, where'd you hear about Get a Guide? I said, from a hitchhiker. <laughs> he said, that's good enough for me. And here's the guide I got. His name was Guido, very famous guy. In fact, he was known as Guido the Guy. <laughs> Here's Guido the Guy leading me around a bed of quicksand. Here's Guido the Guy from the waist up. <laughs> That's his hat right there. Here's the rescue party rushing to his aid. And there's the rescue party from the waist up. <laughs> And here we have a lot of hats and ropes. <laughs> there I am back at Get A Guide. <laughs> the man said, come on in, can I get you a guide? I said, I had a guide. I like my deposit back. He said, give us another chance, and we haggle back and forth, and here's my new guide. Son of Guido. <laughs> and that's his hat right there. That's all we have time for. When we meet again, I'll be showing you more exciting slides. Such slides as Mary Poppins stealing umbrellas. <laughs> Lady Bird dancing to an Everett Dirksen record. <laughs> A shot of Bobby and Clyde double dating with Sonny and Cher. <laughs> also, when we meet again, I hope to have enough money for projecting a screen, because this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but this uh, you guys are probably fairly close to my age. I was five when Peter Gunn went on the air in 58. Okay. So I don't remember it at that age. But right. at some point in the next two, three, four years, particularly possibly when it went into reruns, I somehow stumbled across it, became acquainted with it and became enamored of it, frankly. And I thought to myself, God, I love this bar setting. I'd love to just go hang out in a jazz bar <laughs> uh, at, at the age of eight. Uh, and, and it's always stuck with me ever since. And so I, I just love revisiting uh, that show and that setting. I would have loved to have asked Henry Mancini if he got his idea to do jazz in this from uh, there was a, a syndicated show on radio called Casey Crime Photographer and they would hang out at a bar called the Blue Note wow. and the animal player was Teddy Wilson. No kidding. No kidding. Geez, I've got to check that out. And also Herman Chittiger was also one of the. The PS. I'm wondering, you know, the, the, the timeline, was he playing with Billy Holiday at that time as well? I mean, just think, just think about that kind of stuff. It, that's what really fascinates me about that whole era. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's even right. McCarthyism is exciting to me. From back then. <laughs> I did yeah. ask Henry about that in the two instances where I was able to sit down and talk to him at some length about this period, and he said that the idea of doing a jazz score was really a practical thing because he knew he was going to have to write for a jazz band in the waterfront saloon scenes. So there was going to have to be a band on camera. So he's got to write that stuff already. And he figures, well, why don't I use the same band, augmented slightly, for the dramatic score? So that was really where it came about. And he said that it wasn't even Blake's idea. Blake said, well, you know, do what you think is best. You know, obviously there's a jazz band. And so Henry was able to use his own judgment and his own creativity to draw on this sound 
for what would become the innovative Peter Gunn dramatic score. And so you have to give him credit. So, and But as you guys were pointing out, he was a practical guy. He had been writing for years for B-movies. It was like, you get the assignment on Monday, we're recording Friday at 10 o'clock, have all your cues all ready to go. He'd be writing these two and a half, three and a half minute cues for Francis the Talking Mule and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Um, and it was just a practical thing that he learned. Yeah. David and I, from being from the music business, we saw the same thing. The Wrecking Crew, they weren't known as the Wrecking Crew. They did the monkeys and they did the Archies, and then they'd go play jazz clubs at night. Nobody thought that the boomers would <laughs> never let go of this culture. <laughs> We're, uh, the Stones are still satisfaction in their 80s, which is pretty damn good, I think. But yes, it was, again, that's what fascinated me, John, because I'm relating it to the music business. David and I know, and we've interviewed many of the Wrecking Crew guys, and oh, no, that was just our job. Who knew? Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and I'm just glad that one of the reasons that, that, that for the timing of the book was this year marks Henry Mancini's centennial. It's 100 years since the, since his birth in 1924. And I wanted to do something that would contribute somehow to the centennial. And this area had never really been covered in any depth. And I just felt that it needed to be. We do love the records and we've got the albums. And thank God they're now on CD and they're on Spotify and whatever favorite streaming services are. But it's nice to know what the backstory of all this is, how this this came about. The fact that Dreamsville, one of the great numbers from the Peter Gunn albums, was written as filler for the album. Oh my God, it's just, it's a piece of genius. With Bob Bain on guitar and Johnny Williams on piano, it's just a masterpiece to me. And Hank probably banged it out in two days. If that. If that. That helped pave the way for soundtracks to be successful. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I do spend a little time on the book on this whole idea of the fact that really in the 1950s, until the late 50s and early 60s, there was really no soundtrack business. Today, it's a billion-dollar enterprise. Sure, in the 80s, yeah. The number one records are all soundtracks. Yeah, that's right. And so, but in this era, the luck of the draw was that the head of programming at NBC, which bought Peter Gunn, for his first two seasons, happened to be former a and guy yeah. at a record label. And in fact, at, at Capitol. So he's the, Alan Livingston is the guy who said, the music in this show is pretty good. Maybe we could get an album, get a record out of this. So then the wheels start to turn. And uh, because NBC's sister company is RCA Victor, that seems to be the obvious place to go. And the rest is history. Well, another thing that, you know, you say the 80s was the, uh, that's where the billion dollar soundtrack started. Yeah. That's because... You had all these different people, stars, on these recordings. If you go into the 50s, if it was Damn Yankees, it was the cast from Damn Yankees. Right. If it was Old Man River, it was the people in Showboat. Yeah, it's a soundtrack, but it's apples and oranges. It yeah. really, really is. And it wasn't created by, let's say, one guy or one co-writing team mm -hmm. to put that together. The soundtracks of today have absolutely not. Sometimes they have nothing to do with the movies. Yeah, boy, that's a bugaboo with me, you know. <laughs> Music from and inspired by. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> But in this case, I remember when I really started digging into the dark sides of all of this, I kept thinking, think about that. RCA Victor didn't even really want to put it out. They said, well, we'll press 8,000 copies and we'll just see where it goes. And then inside of less than two months, Peter Gunn album sold 250,000 copies. Yes, the show was a hit. It was in the top 20 within the first three months of being aired on NBC. But people really caught on to that music what they were hearing every week. And they wanted to be able to buy that music rather than just listening to it on TV every Monday night. And the fact that they came out in droves by the hundreds of thousands to buy this record Nobody had ever bought a TV soundtrack before, almost literally. Dragnet had been a number one hit for Ray Anthony back in 53, 54, but that was just a 45. The Davy Crockett theme was big in 55. I and ended up 45. There you go. <laughs> well, Dwayne Eddy, Dwayne Eddy made a hit out of Peter Gunn, too. A year or two later, that's yeah. right. And it was surprisingly big in England, where Peter Gunn didn't even air. Wow, yeah. <laughs> well, yes, but you can make a direct correlation to the band The Shadows. That's right. That's, That's really where that. One of the other things about Peter Gunn that amazed me was how much it costs to shoot. <laughs> 
You can buy a Jeep. I worked really hard to find those budget numbers. Let me tell you. (laughs) I dug and dug and dug. And so, yes, you're right. Those shows cost $49,000 to shoot. And for season two, they got uh, as high as $52,000 to shoot. That's right. I read that. Yes. (laughs) It's interesting. Hey, I got a question about season three. Yeah. ABC was a real prick. (laughs) And Blake Edwards didn't write any of the stories in season C, correct? No, that's right. That's so right. I'm not really sure your answer is the correct answer because not that you're wrong. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but that it sounds like a corporate thing. Well, Blake Edwards isn't doing it. Fuck them. We're done. All of this is part and parcel of what I see as a very complicated web, which is partly involved with the sponsors, partly involved with the networks, and partly involved with the people making the show. The issue with Blake was that by the third season, which was the 6061 season, his movie career was starting to take off. And that's where everybody really wanted to be was in the movies. And that's where, frankly, the big bucks could be, as much as you can make on a television, a successful TV show. So by the time we're getting to 1961, he's shooting Breakfast at Tiffany's with Audrey Hepper. His focus is not on Peter Gunn. He really is letting the other guys run the show by this time. But Henry Mancini, who's a very loyal cat, said, I'm not only going to stick with Peter Gunn and do every episode, but I'll do your movies at the same time, Blake. And he did. He managed to do all this. Top of that, in the middle of this, the 59-60 season, he's not only doing Peter Gunn, he's doing Mr. Lucky, the other Blake Edwards show from that period of time. Working seven days a week to write probably 15 or so minutes of music for Peter Gunn and 10 or 15 minutes of music for Mr. Lucky. Boy, talk about a workaholic. But Yeah, getting back to ABC, I mean, yeah. they bought that show because it was a big hit. Sponsor be damned. They bought the show because it was a big hit. And I think with Blake's gone, they said, fuck this. Well, <laughs> here's what happened. I don't think, no matter what anybody says, 10.30 on a Monday night is not a great time slot. So I think you're, auto, you're already losing audience. The other thing, I don't know if you noticed this at the end of my discussion of season three, Greg Stevens, who played Peter Gunn, claimed in an interview that Blake came to him late in that third season and said, I can't stick with the show. My movie career is taking off. Uh, I've got things to do that I really would rather do. And Craig claims Blake was the one who more or less pulled the plug. Now, I'm not sure I buy that. That's exactly right. Because I think that problem is, the problem comes down to the sponsor who decides that they don't want to sponsor Peter Gunn anymore. They've got other things that they would rather put their uh, commercials on. And in that era, it was this stuff was very sponsor-driven. That was Bristol Myers, I think, was the uh, primary sponsor. Yeah, but you Gunn. said something in the book that ABC wasn't a sponsor-driven network and that Bristol Myers was in talks with CBS. Well, yes. Early on in the season, there was talk about shifting over to CBS. But again, Bristol Myers was in the driver's seat. They were the ones who controlled those time slots, which does not happen today. It's very interesting. This was an education for me, and I thought I knew a lot about TV in that era. Uh, But in fact, the the sponsors really did control certain specific time slots. And so, as you correctly point out, David, there was talk earlier in that third season about maybe shifting to a different night and a different time slot. But ultimately, it didn't happen. And that could well be, because Blake said, see ya. You know? yeah. One thing that Tom and I were talking about yesterday was in the book, you have, what is it, four pictures of TV Guide? Yes, yeah. they did. With- they were on four cover covers. Okay. TV Guide was a Bible back then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would get the, the, the TV Guide would arrive on a, on a Tuesday or Wednesday in our house. I would immediately sit down with it. I was probably maybe nine or 10 years old, I would immediately sit down with it and make a list of every show I was going to watch that week on television. The Man from Uncle was on at 10 o'clock Friday night. The Green Hornet was on at 7.30 uh, Friday night on ABC. Do I watch The Wild Wild West or The Green Hornet? I don't know. Or do I watch Tarzan on, a- on NBC? This week in TV Guide, a look at why the doors in the hallowed halls of Congress are barred to radio and television, and a report on the movement that's underway to unlock those doors. The story makes interesting reading in TV Guide. Oh, I remember going to school one day. I was punished the night before, and everyone was talking about the uh, Twilight Zone episode, and I had to keep my mouth shut. It was so embarrassing, because that that was it. But in terms of TV Guide, that wasn't just scheduling TV. It was interviews with the stars. 
It was self-help tips. It was this, that, and the other <laughs> thing. Tom and I were wondering, when did TV Guide really die? TV Guide really died in the, uh, I would say, late 80s or the mid 90s. It still actually does exist. In fact, a close friend of mine, Matt Rausch, is still TV Guide's number one critic. What happened was not just the explosion of cable, but the point in the 1990s at which cable companies were not just offering us 20 or 30 channels, they were offering us hundreds of channels. And it becomes ne next to impossible to sort of keep everything straight and list everything that's available to you. It becomes less and less significant. To go back just a little bit to TV Guide in its heyday, it's interesting to me that when I became a journalist in the 1970s, TV Guide was looked down upon as any kind of source, legit source for real news of any kind about TV or, or the media in general. Well, let me tell you, going back and looking at that stuff now, thank God those those articles existed, those people did the stories they did. I got a lot of great quotes from Blake Edwards and Craig uh, Albright, uh, Lola Albright and Craig Steve. A lot of great stuff came out of TV Guide. And when TV Guide took an editorial stance halfway through the Mr. Lucky season to decry what had happened, which is the sponsor came out and Mr. Lucky and said, well, you got to get rid of the gambling meal. You're no more gambling. It's bad. They're, mm. They hate us in the South. Uh, they're not buying our products because of gambling. Well, that was all nonsense. Right. Um, of course. You, like there were know. no speakeasies down South. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> so, it, but TV Guide took an editorial stance saying this is a bad thing. Don't do this. Right. You know, it, it affects is, the artistic content. Yeah. But that guy, Aubrey, was that his name? Jim Aubrey, the smiling cobra. Woo. <laughs> Wow. Uh, and, and and again, this is another thing that I'm very proud of in terms of the book. Everybody in show business knew about the battles that Jim Aubrey and Blake Edwards had over the film Wild Rovers, the William Holden picture from around 1970. What nobody knew until I managed to uncover it was that Blake and Jim Aubrey got into it when Jim Aubrey was the president of CBS in 1959. And Blake said, how can you do this? And he and Aubrey had words about it. And Blake took his name off the show. He was so furious. Wow. John, you talk about TV Guide being looked down upon. And in 1969, 61, was television as a medium looked down upon? David and I play an instrument called the electric bass. David went to a place called Berkeley School of Music, a pretty, pretty interesting place to go. David, what did they tell you about our beloved instrument? Oh, what was it, 1971, Mr. Gross, the electric bass is not a valid musical instrument. <laughs> <laughs> However, four years later, I was in this band on RCA, uh, of all things, and they're touting me at the Berkeley Performance Center as former student. Right. How was television looked upon? I mean, we didn't have the respect of film, obviously. No, and shows like Gilligan's Island and the Beverly Hillbillies didn't really help. Oh, they, well, the Beverly Hillbillies were canceled because the network president was embarrassed, right? Yeah. Not because of ratings. That's amazing. Yeah. No, that's right. And then one of those, it's one of those strange things. TV was still finding its footing. These in early 60s period. Movie people looked down on television. And certainly people in literature looked down on television. It was a visual medium for sure. To go back to what we were talking about earlier, when you look at some of the stuff that was coming out of there. I did an album of music from Dr. Kildare a few years ago, unearthed all the old Jerry Goldsmith tracks and, and put together a box set. And I watched, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 of those Kildares. Man, that was good stuff. They were really telling great stories about people. They were getting into things uh, that you wouldn't have expected, like what a racket the funeral home business was and is. And it was stunning to find some of the stuff that was happening. <laughs> Please help him. Well, we'll help him, but we have to know what happened. And of course, as we've mentioned, the anthology series like, you know, Climax and Playhouse 90 were just great stuff yeah. almost every week. Not everything is great every week on anything. Who was it that said 90 percent of everything is junk? There's a lot of not so great Peter Guns, but there's enough great Peter Guns in there that it's worth going into. Did you guys I can't remember if it's season one or season two, the episode The Dummy, where I can't remember now who, who gets murdered. I guess it's the ventriloquist or somebody. The ventriloquist gets murdered. Yeah. And I don't want to give it away because you really people should really see the episode of the dummy. The the revelation of 
the role of the dummy in this murder case, the role of the dummy <laughs> was <laughs> astonishing. And I thought <laughs> it was a suspense episode. Yeah. Moreover, yeah. if you go to early uh, Twilight Zone, Chuck uh, Cliff Robertson is a ventriloquist. Oh, yeah where That's he right. does not die, but his dummy takes over. Ladies and gentlemen, we're certainly glad to be here tonight. Speak for yourself, Turkey. That's Jerry. <laughs> Every dummy to his own taste. <laughs> now cut that out. All right, all right, let go of the suit. I'm getting out of here. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute now, Willie. Just stay right here. Uh -huh. I mean it. Uh -huh. I'm sorry if I said anything. I, uh, I, I didn't mean it. Oh, no? No. No? No. Just tell me this, wise guy. You did admit that you were superstitious now, didn't you? Well, on occasion, yes. But you don't throw salt over your shoulders or cross your fingers or anything like that. No, I knock on wood. Well, you did it again! Wait a minute, no, wait a minute. I resign. From now on, I'm a single. And for you, you can turn in your lap! <laughs> uh, why, Willie, uh, in the first place, what would you do without me? Well, for one thing, I could be a better ventriloquist. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Watch this. A funny thing happened to me on my way over to the club tonight. Is that a fact? What happened, Blockhead? I was out in front of the Ritz Savoy. And that's where I live. Out in front of the Ritz Savoy. <laughs> you put formaldehyde in those jokes? Oh, something must deserve them. <laughs> You're watching a ventriloquist named Jerry Etherson, a voice thrower par excellence. His alter ego sitting atop his lap is a brass stick of kindling with the sobriquet Willie. In a moment, Mr. Etherson and his naughty pine partner will be booked into one of the out-of-the-way bistros, that small, dark, intimate place known as the Twilight Zone. Yes, I remember that one. That's that's another classic. That's why I'm saying certain things, you know, just happen to... By the way, Richard Chamberlain and I share a birthday, March oh, 31st. Right. Yeah. John, when, when did television gain the respect of film? What did it ever gain this respect of film? I tend to think, and especially this came up during my the research I did on my book, Music for Prime Time, which is really mm. a history of, of music throughout television. Yeah, we've got to talk about that one. 1948 to, to date. I look at it in the 70s. Okay. Because when major filmmakers came to television to start doing miniseries, when you think about things like QB7 and Holocaust, it was television that really dealt seriously with the tragedy of, of World War II, way more than in the movies. And then you get things like Roots and The Thornbirds and Rich Man, Poor Man, although that's really more of a soap opera. Shogun, the original Shogun in 1980, right. that was grand scale drama that you couldn't see or get anywhere else. So I think there's this level of respect that comes along in the 1970s that hadn't been there before. Well, we also in the 1970s, you, you could react quicker, like you take the anti-war show like MASH. Right. Or All in the Family with the social commentary on that. That's when television yeah. really started to grow up. In my, yes, and I was right. a 13 year old kid watching that. Yeah. That's exactly right. Thanks for pointing that out. Norman Lear did television a huge mm -hmm. favor. Yeah. You know, okay. He took a chance by dealing with social issues, but doing it in an entertaining context. And so, yeah, TV really grew up at that point. Yeah. See, it's interesting you say that because. You know, going back to the 50s again, and the fact that great stuff happened, when you have people like that who may not have really thought TV was a great thing, you can't stop them from being creative. However, once we get Beverly Hillbillies and Gilgit's Island, I could really make a good case that TV to this day is the biggest pandering anesthetizer <laughs> on the planet, that the social issues were, it was bullshit. Yeah. I mean, plain and simple. The whole thing's bullshit. Shogun was bullshit. Roots was bullshit. The Holocaust, <laughs> it was, oh, aren't we special? And and if you think about it, the actors and everyone that, and don't for a minute think that the directors were going, 
Oh, I'm going to do art. No, I'm going to make some dough. <laughs> it's true. Really? I mean, just, especially in those days, the director in television is little more than a traffic cop. Okay, we, let's get these six scenes done before five o'clock tonight. You can occasionally get creative, but really to bring this back to the, the early episodes of Peter Gunn, Blake's concept and what he wanted to do which was to make this look like film noir. Yeah. Not just the shadows, but the wet streets at night. And I was able to actually access shooting schedules that indicated that yes, they started at nine o'clock in the morning, but they were often still shooting at 11 o'clock at night. So you're, which this is not day for night shooting. You're actually shooting at night wet streets. And it looked great. And it still does to this day, you know, the neon sign that's, that flashed mothers outside of the, uh, the saloon. I mean, it's just... And it affects it, the actors, too. I mean, it puts them more deeply into the role. We we know that. That's why some of the great rock and roll albums are live albums. Yeah, true. And also, the critical claim now, Time and Newsweek and Billboard, you mentioned in the book, that they, they praised the show. The New York Times was lukewarm, I guess. They didn't, they no, didn't no. care for it. They, they, the New York Times panned the show. Oh, they, they did pan it. Okay. They hated, they hated Peter Gunn. <laughs> I see that, David. And um, Downbeat was suspicious, but we learned that Peter Gunn did very well with the disc jockey radio program polls in the That's magazine, right. which they used to have, That's whereas right. it was cited for excellence and popularity. So interesting to see how the how the mainstream came along. It's interesting you talk about your students. Now, I was born in 1960, so in the 60s, and up until cable TV really took over in the 80s, we used to watch reruns. I used to see the Bowery Boys and Perry Mason and Clark Gable. And I think that's a shame that students or young people don't learn the sense of history of where they came from, where this medium came from. Do you find that with your students that they don't, that they don't have a sense of history, even though with YouTube, you can watch everything? Yeah, well, we were lucky in the sense that even in the 70s, we probably only had access to five or six channels before cable started to hit. So we had the opportunity to see not only what was current on television, but all the reruns from the 50s and 60s that we might have missed because we were too young. Right. That's certainly where I encountered Peter Gunn was in reruns. And when I moved to Los Angeles in 1986 and discovered that it was still running every night, I was just over the moon. And to this day, I still, I still have the VHS tapes that I made of every episode of Peter Gunn because I was not <laughs> going to miss this. Um, so, <laughs> so that's a bit you more. It's than... also interesting about Peter Gunn that you heard the streets, you heard footsteps, but it, it fascinated me. I could have been more than 10 years old. I was watching the 39 steps. And I remember saying to my mom, I hear footsteps. Because most American TV was shot in the studio and you did not hear footprints. It was really an interesting revelation, I think, for me. Yeah, I mean, by 1958, Blake had but started in the, he had not only had serious experience in radio, where you would, where, where sound effects were terribly important, sure. but he was, he was also then experienced doing film, a handful of films at that point. So I think that he applied all of this to what he wanted to do with Peter Gunn, which was to really create an atmosphere. I mean, it's one of the reasons I put the word noir in the title. That was an atmospheric show. When he went to see Billy Barty uh, at the pool room, for example, you're watching the pool being played, you're hearing those balls hitting. And it's just, it was a place I wanted to be. I just love that stuff. Let's talk a little bit about Mr. Lucky. Okay, you've got mm -hmm. one season of Peter Gunn behind you. It's a huge hit. It's selling hundreds of thousands of albums. What can Blake Edwards do? He can sell another show to another network without even making a pilot. And that's what he did. He got the rights to the original story that became the Cary Grant movie, Mr. Lucky, in the 40s, and then turned that into a TV show about a gambler, who wins a yacht, a grand scale yacht in a in a poker game, and turns it into just three miles off of our shores, turns right. it into a gambling casino place where you would you would take a, a, a launch out to the out to the, the boat, you would gamble away the night, maybe have dinner, and then you would bring the launch back to uh, to shore late at night. And so that was basically the premise of, of Mr. Lucky. Started star John Vivian and the great character actor Ross Martin as his Probably sidekick. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what and it and it did very well. This was on CBS on Saturday nights, by the way. And it did very well. And then as we've talked a little bit about already uh, in this show, 
Halfway through the run of Mr. Lucky, the sponsor got cold feet and didn't want to offend, as they claimed, viewers in the Deep South who were complaining about gambling being immoral or uh, distasteful somehow. John Vivian claimed he never got any mail like that, that he had got lots of mail from the South and nobody complained about the gambling milieu. The sponsor gets cold feet, man's changes in the show, so they turn it into a floating restaurant instead of a, a, a gambling casino. And the show was not as good. It wasn't bad. Vivian and, and Great Martin soundtrack, had. though. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, that's and, a great tune. That album, that album is, you know, and when you think about it's, it's just, and I've used the word astonishing a couple times, I think. When you think about how great these tunes were, and Henry Mancini wrote one great tune after another, and these albums are all so listenable today. I actually think we've taken Henry Mancini's melodic sense for granted because it was so good for so long. But there's two great albums out of Mr. Lucky, just as there were two great albums out of Peter Gunn. The second album, Mr. Lucky Goes Latin, was actually one of Mancini's personal favorites. So the music was always great. Different, entirely different sound than Peter Gunn. It's still very jazzy, but more elegant. There were strings in that main title, for example, for Mr. Lucky. And an organ solo. That, yeah, that, what a great that, solo, too. I mentioned in the book that um, in the interview section with Henry, he, he got fan mail, which was yes. not typical of composers. The stars on the screen resonate with the audience, but producers, writers, costume and set designers, along with the composers, th those accolades come only from critics, but trade publications and, and, of course, the award shows, but fans wanted to see stars. But Henry became a star in his own right. That's, I, I can't think of any other TV composer that, that achieved that success. That's right. That's right. And, and it's one of the one of the mm -hmm. big points that I try to make in the book, which is that Henry Mancini, as a result of this three year period from 59 to 6, mm -hmm. 58, 61, when he did Peter Gunn and Mr. Lucky, it was the beginning of his entire career in so many ways, because this was the foundation of the relationship he had with filmmaker Blake Edwards, mm -hmm. which after they left television resulted in Breakfast at Tiffany's and the great song Moon River. Days of Wine and Roses, The Pink Panther, The Great Race. So many of these movies of the 1960s and then late, not just the entire Pink Panther series, but also movies like Victor Victoria, which won uh, Mancini his fourth Oscar. It was a long relationship which produced a lot of really great music and a handful of great films. And to come back to your point, Henry Mancini became the first film composer to become a household name. Everybody knew, because, I knew as a kid knew who Henry Mancini was. He was on, as, he was on a variety show. Carol exactly. Burnett. Yeah. He'd go on TV. He would play piano. He would conduct pops concerts yeah. of not only his music, but other people's music as well. And so it was a, uh, and we haven't talked about the business side, which, about the fact that he owned the copyrights, Peter yeah. Gunn, Mr. Lucky, which was so lucrative. And he was such a, a sought after composer that the studios in the 1960s often broke their own rule, which was always, we own all of the copyrights and all mm -hmm. of the publishing on all of our movie music. They made their exception for, for Henry Mancini and they gave him half the publishing on things like the Pink Panther. Mm -hmm and charade and several of these movies which made henry mancini not only a household name but a millionaire to boot think too about the late 50s and the rat pack you could almost say that the the, the rat pack come before the chicken before the egg was the the cool of both the music and the style quake edwards or, or was it frank sinatra and then when you think about the music of the rat pack you think about nelson riddle yeah, exactly. another one of the all-time great arrangements Maybe the greatest arranger we ever had of that kind of music, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. And Nelson Riddle winds up doing The Untouchables uh, just after Peter Gunn hits big. And then Route 66, and that's another hit single for Nelson Riddle.
Nelson Riddle was really the music of the Rack Pack, was really Riddle. You quote Gene Cipriano, the sax player. He says the popularity of the series prompted more TV producers and directors to use jazz in their TV scores. Absolutely true. And we've been talking about copycat, TV being a copycat medium. This is exactly what happens. As soon as Peter Gunn hits big, every producer of a cop and detective show in television said, we got to have a jazz score. No, I don't care what we've been doing. Give us a jazz score. So Stay the monkeys? Huh? If you really think about it, because Tom and I discuss this all the time about how bitter jazz musicians were when the 60s rolled around. This is another reason why it wasn't just that there wasn't jazz happening because it wasn't popular anymore. The work was gone. It became boogaloo and R&B and and rock music. So they were out of work. Well, every generation, a new studio posse comes in and they replace what was before them. So yeah, I could. Yeah. And it's it's funny. The, the jazz trend of cop and detective show themes actually runs through most of the 1960s. You've got Count Basie doing M Squad and Duke Ellington doing the TV version of of Asphalt Jungle. Dave Brubeck comes in to do Mr. Broadway in 64. It shifts eventually and and it becomes less it less of a trend, less in vogue to do right. a jazz thing. Although you had what you had the great Quincy Jones, right? Didn't he do Barney Miller and Sanford and Son? Well he did Ironside, which was okay. a comedy show. You know, okay. And here's the other thing. Quincy starts Ironside in 67 and 68 with the pilot in that first season. Mm. But who follows Quincy Jones? Oliver Nelson. Some of those Oliver Nelson scores for mm-hmm. Irons are fabulous. When Oliver leaves and goes to do other shows, who comes in? Marty Page, who with his deck tet was, you know, was backing Mel Torme. And so all these guys are doing, I have to say, great music for television that is unfortunately largely forgotten today if it wasn't immortalized on LP. I worked in television for 20 years. I was a copywriter for a, uh, for a news production company. I was, uh, you remember Mary Tyler Moore, I was Murray. I, I you know, I had a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Murray Slaughter. I was Murray Slaughter, yes, yes. And and unfortunately, most of the people I w- wrote for were much like Ted Baxter in real life. <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to condemn my uh, news background. Cable TV, I cut the cord last year because I got tired of paying for commercials with a little bit of content in between. Once upon a time, there was an engineer. Choo-choo Charlie was his name, we hear. He had an engine and he sure had fun. He television make a comeback in that the way we're talking about or is the monoculture over and it's not going to happen again? i hate to say it i think it's a complicated issue mm, you know i tend to watch and listen to things that appeal to me based on what i grew up with and what i feel is in good taste and i feel like at my age i'm i'm entitled to say well i have taste now i know <laughs> what i want to see i don't find as many compelling scores written for television today. So I did in that early period of time when people like Jerry Goldsmith and Lalo Schifrin and right. Johnny Williams and Henry Mancini were doing, were practicing this kind of, of stuff. But television itself is different now. I do love a number of shows that are on the air, but I don't watch them the way I used to. I used to like the four acts and I could get up and make a sandwich during the one minute commercial between act three and four, you know, that kind of thing. And so now we're sort of asked to watch these eight and 10 hour series and people talk about binging. I can't sit for eight hours and watch one thing. I just can't. <laughs> Unless it's damned compelling and I just don't find that much of it that compelling. Also, you know, David, one of the things we talk about in the music industry is, is this thing called AI. Now, digital platforms have put film production in the hands of the proletariat. You can have your own show on YouTube. You don't have to go to a network to get published or, or broadcast. Can we see something as innovative as Peter Gunn, perhaps, with AI or just the fact that people now what's the fuck am I? No, you don't think so. I'm, no, okay. that's not happening. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you where where AI is going to have a, an impact. I think in terms yeah. of scoring for 
TV and films. And it's going to be the stuff where production of music and produ production music and library music is now routinely used, which is on the sort of low budget documentary side where they can basically put generic dramatic music under almost anything and it'll sort of work. That's where AI, I think I, yeah. I fear for the people who have been making their livings in production and library music, because I think AI may well come in and, and uh, unless the unions can do something to stop it, but I'm not sure that's even possible. I'm sure the unions are getting payola on that stuff too, though. Yeah. The musicians may not be, but the organization is. But you know, you talk about Jerry Goldsmith and Mancini and, and all of that, and Tom makes the point, it was just another day at the office. TV shows of today and, and you know, maybe the last 20 years, I wouldn't know because I, when I went to college in the 70s, I stopped watching TV pretty much with yeah. gig at night. So, but the thing that, that I'm thinking is when people write for TV now, they're probably writing, I want to have a hit. I want to have this. So it's not being written the same way either with the same, I've got to get these 15 minutes done. Oh, this will work. It's yeah. a different thing. Yeah, it's it, it, TV is made differently. There's no question about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been reading a lot. I'm about to start another book on a different television series. And, and I've been reading up on exactly how television was made. And basically, when you would see written by X, that guy actually wrote the script himself. Today, there are writer's rooms on practically every show on television, which means the creator, the writer of the pilot generally, or the first episode or two, has now is now working with an entire ensemble of writers, many of whom are contributing ideas or dialogue or thoughts or comments. And so it's, it's largely being made by committee much more now than in the old days, when there was a producer, a writer, a director, and a composer. And that world doesn't really exist anymore in television. So it's a different time, a different era. What do your students aspire to do in television? Well, uh, I teach film music history, oh, in, history. The scoring, in the scoring program at USC. Okay. What I'm finding is about half of them want to do movies and about half of them want to do video games. So it's a different time mm -hmm. now, even for compo young composers coming up. I'm not a video game player, although I've listened to a lot of music that's been made for games and some of it is quite good. The game thing is really out of my demographic. <laughs> <laughs> Or I'm out of its demographic, should I say. <laughs> yes, we all are. We all are. Now, what is the TV show you're writing the new book on? I'm going to keep that a secret for it's a little while. a secret, David. We have to have him back on the show. <laughs> oh, but we'll do that anyway. I want to have him back on the show to do the old books. Send us those. Old yeah, I want to get the, we definitely yeah, want to talk yeah, about the um, James Bond and, and uh, Sound and Vision. We definitely have to talk about it. Well, John, thanks for being a guest. <laughs> I can't remember when I've had so much fun talking to two musicians. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, musicians, fun. right. We're, we, uh, yes. And, and again, you know, David and I are such big fans of the book. It's wonderful for me. Like I said, I'm going back and watching all of it on YouTube. And I have to say, the, the video was well preserved. I mean, it's really in high depth or close to it. Well, they shot that on 35 millimeter. You can tell the difference if they shoot on 16 and it generally looks cheap. Five millimeter prints look pretty good now. Yeah, they look they look great. And it's a whole new world there to to watch all this uh, all this great and we got to thank Tizzy Arnaz because a lot of this stuff would not have been done if it wasn't for him yeah he was a real visionary when it comes to television all right John uh, thanks for having us we'll send you the links when when the show airs and everything thank you thank you guys all right a real pleasure bye-bye bye-bye right. bye Winston gives you real flavorful, rich tobacco flavor. Winston's easy drawing too. The filter lets the flavor through. Winston tastes good like a cigarette chew. David, great conversation with John Burlingame. A fabulous guest. I hope we do have him back soon. He's got a number of books out that I know I want to read. Right, exactly. So hopefully John will be kind enough to visit us once again. David, tell us what our listener can expect from the Notes from an Artist, John Burlingame, Dreamsville playlist. My thought for this was obviously we're going to play Peter Gunn and Mr. Lucky, but the entire playlist is going to be jazz versions of TV themes. So you may hear three or four different versions of Peter Gunn. You may hear three or four versions 
of Mr. Lucky. But I can guarantee you're going to hear lots of great Henry Mancini. All right. Cool playlist. Well, thanks once again for listening to Notes from an Artist. My name is Tom Simioli. Keep your hand on the ground and your feet in the air. I really don't know if I want to give my name out after (laughs) such an ending. But I'm David C. Gross. We will see you next week and have a wonderful week, folks. Enjoy the beginnings of summer. Bye-bye.